before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta or Sacred Garden Yoga. If you're watching this on Sacred Garden Yoga, I am joined here with my friend Cindy from Sacred Garden Yoga. How are you doing today, Cindy? I'm doing well. I'm glad to be here. Haven't mm -hmm. been on a channel in a long time. We were just talking about that beforehand, so it's fun to be back. You got stuff going on in your lives. You got you got you you've got your mm -hmm. life to live. So it's totally understandable. And but I'm really excited. We've actually been talking about doing this video for a while now and it just scheduling just kept messing up and finally we're able to to sit down and talk about this really to me a very fascinating subject. I know to some people probably not, but I'm a nerd and I think you are too, Cindy, when it comes to this kind of stuff. And we got, I, I, I posted up on my community tab on YouTube asking for questions regarding um, exercise, spirituality, mullabunda, all these things that I've been talking about that Cindy talks about in her classes. And um, we got a few questions and we're going to make you wait till the end because we're going to answer them for you, but you're going to have to wait till the end of the, of the video to hear the answer to these questions that we got. But um, before we get started, I wanted to start with, you know, Cindy, we're living, you and I, I don't mean to be rude, but you and I have been like textbook weirdos since the day we were probably born. Like, we were into spirituality before it was cool to be into spirituality, weren't we? Totally. Yes. <laughs> we're OG. Before it was cool. Be before there was the Instagrams and all that stuff. And um, back, when the, back when I was looking through yellow pages, <laughs> looking for a yoga video. Like, that's how long ago it was. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Uh, my boyfriend, the same thing. He he had to find a recommendation for India, and he had to go through the yellow pages to find Tim Miller over in <laughs> out in California, and had to like call him up. And you know, so yeah, it's you have to you had to go on a scavenger hunt to get get what you needed in order to find what you're looking for. And I think sometimes I call it pop spirituality now that we have. You know, we have the internet now, which is great in a lot of ways. We can do this. We can talk about this. We can we can advertise our businesses. We can get this information out faster and quicker. But the flip side, we have a lot of like fake spirituality. We have a lot of um a lot of what I call pop spirituality that really isn't founded on any well foundation founded on any foundation of, of, of lineage. And the the beautiful thing about lineage when it comes to understanding spirituality is that you have these years of information of trial and error where people have really done the work to understand what it is we talk about when we're talking about spirituality. And the one thing I think people oftentimes get confused about when you're talking about having a spiritual practice, first and foremost, you're talking about working on your own spirit, right? I think people want to skip all the way to like channeling, which is fun. Tarot cards are fun, but they forget that first you've got to actually know your own spirit first before you can actually venture outside of yourself. And we see people wanting to like open their third eye, but yet they're totally not even aware of Muladhara and Mulabunda. And it's like um, without Muladhara or, Mula, or, or Mulabunda, it's like the foundation of a house. Without a good foundation, the house is going to fall. You know, and so um, that's what I kind of wanted to focus on with you today, Cindy, because um, it's just so important. And it is so important for anybody going on the spiritual path to not avoid the hard stuff because the mola bundas, the, the lower chakras, well, bundas are, are a lock, but like muladhara, all the way to Manipur, these lower, like the hell of the body, 
that's the real tricky stuff, isn't it? Well, it's in those lower three chakras where your humanity lies, like your true humanity, like those the, the primal aspects of you that, that make you very human. And yeah, that's where all the gnarly stuff is. And uh, the, it, it is much easier to want to just bypass your spiritual bypass all of that and go directly up to here. Like, mm -hmm. Let me just skip all that. Let's go to the heart or let's go to here. Or let's go to here. <laughs> yeah. Um, this this was a gnarly one too, actually, the throat chakra. But, you know, we, we automatically want to, to skip uh, what makes us human and go straight to, uh, you know, the, the, the element of the spirit, the, what, the matter, the part of us, you know, we talk about in, in yoga, in the class of oftentimes, it's the unity of your spirit and matter. Yeah. It's embodied spirit or spiritualizing your body. Um, yeah. But to have to, to come down and to descend into what makes you human and all the feelings and emotions and uh, you're talking about uh, Muldahara, um, that's where like all the abandonment issues lie, the you know, trauma from the inner child. And, and I know these days it's, it's definitely become a lot more popular to do some of some of that work, like, you know, some of that shadow work. But then um, it's interesting that you're talking about how, you know, we used to have to back in the day of the yellow pages and stuff. And I, and I know I sound like a total Gen Xer now. <laughs> um, you know, it's like we had to go through almost like a pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. You had to have this, this deep hunger and this deep desire to want to know yourself and to go through the process of that and finding your teachers. I mean, it was like you did. It was like a pilgrimage that you went through because you had such a strong hunger for it. And now that the information so you're saying it's, it's more easily available, yes, which is a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. That means that this information is available to more people. But at the same time, it is much easier to skip through the things that, uh, like even the the yogis or the, the, the people who were on their spiritual path back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, they didn't have access to the information that they have now. Um, but it made them have to go through the process versus now. It is much easier to, to skip through and pick and choose what it is that you want to learn about. Right. And we also were in this, I, there's this great story that the Hathors tell in the Hathor material by Tom Kenyon, because we see a lot of similarity between like old Egyptian alchemy and like yoga teachings. There's a lot of similarities, different words, pretty much the same practices. And they talk, the, the Hathors tell this story about they had these different schools, like beginner, intermediate, kind of more advanced, and you had to work your way up. And they, they tell this story about this man who out his whole life kept trying to go to the advanced school without going to the beginner Aaron and Minnie at first. And they kept turning him away and said, you got to start at the beginning. And he spent his whole life trying to manipulate his way into the advanced school, which he never got in, instead of just going to the beginning. And so he didn't progress in that life. Maybe he learned his lesson, like you got to start at the beginning. And, um, and, and I thought that was such a great story for them to tell because I see that a lot now where people have this, maybe it is social media, this sense of almost entitlement where they, 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 they start their spiritual journey, but nobody wants to be a beginner, right? Nobody mm -hmm. wants to start at the beginning. To me, the beginning is the best part. The beginning is, in the beginning, mm -hmm. there's so, so many possibilities. In the beginning, there's an inspiration. You know, listen, towards the end, a lot of those possibilities are gone and a lot of the inspiration's gone and it's just hard work, you know? And, and we look at, you know, we always say in the Ashtanga world anyway, the easiest students to teach are the beginning students and the advanced students because, because both the beginning students and the advanced stu stu students both know that they know nothing. It's the intermediate mm -hmm. students who are difficult to teach because they think they know everything. And so I, I love all these stories because, again, I see that so much now where people just want to go into their third eye and they, they don't want to touch anything else. And, you know, there's that great book. Um, my mind's gone completely blank now. Eastern body, Western mind. That's the one. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love that. That's, that's a, one that we would use in teacher training. Yeah, that's that's a really great book. I, I recommend it. I think it's actually in my Amazon affiliate link, guys. I'll put that mm -hmm. down below. Um, it's She does a really good job explaining all the chakras in a very simplistic way that's understandable. And it's, it's not overwhelming. You can, like, read one chapter, work through it, and then read the next. 
But I remember in her Ajna, her, her third eye, her sixth chakra chapter, she talked a lot about this fine line between like intuition and like delusions. And mm -hmm. I, I've, I've said that, like, if you don't have a basis in spirituality, if you don't have a basis in Mola Bunda and Mola Dara and these lower, if you're not constantly working on that lower belly area of your body where that spiritual elixir lies, then you run the risk of going into your imagination with your, th and not, mm -hmm. and not intuition. And we're still, I mean, look at, I was just telling you offline, I've been covering Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. That's a really great example. They thought that their kids were zombies or dark spirits okay. because they were intuiting it. No, they weren't. That was, they were married to different people. They wanted to be with each other. And so they got rid of the people in their lives that were standing in the way of that. And, but their imagination mm -hmm. ran wild and now they're both paying the consequences for that. And so I wanted to really, you know, and also when we look at the physical body, we look at, when we talk about the third eye, if we take away, we just look at Shishumna and Kundalini. So Shishumna for people who aren't aware, that's, it's like, it's like your spine, but it's not your spine. It's where your spine is. It's like this, not this, this, it's called a nadi, but it's like this tunnel that runs from the base of the pelvic floor of the body all the way up through the back of the head. The chakras run up Shishumna and then the bandhas, which we're going to talk about, are this lock, this force that moves the kundalini energy or the Christ consciousness energy. I know some people are afraid of the word kundalini. So we'll say Christ con consciousness en energy from the base of the pelvic floor up through the spine. And a kundalini like awakening typically happens in stages. Um, headstand is a way to help that elixir come through the spine. But as it was described to me in India, and I want your thoughts on this too, Cindy, Kundalini is oftentimes represented by a, by a coiled snake, a snake that's just kind of sleeping at the pelvic floor. Now, we live in, in my opinion, one of the hottest areas of the world because it's humid. I don't know anybody in the South that doesn't have a fan in their bedroom and air conditioning going at the same time. So everybody who's in the South or who lives in a warm area of the world knows that when you're sleeping at night and it's freaking hot out, hot outside, you don't get a good night's sleep, right? So when the Kundalini, the coiled energy starts to get moved and interrupted and strengthen and heat that top is that heat starts to come into the body, the strength of the stomach, the strength of the muscles start to come in. It starts to wake up. And it starts to move. And that's when it starts to move up the spine. So you can't really have access, in my opinion, to full access to Ajna without also having full access to the pelvic floor region of your body, that energetic and physical and spiritual connection to the base of your body as well, if that makes sense. What are your thoughts on that, Cindy? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the body and... Yeah, the Kundalini and the Muldahara, the base of the spine, and Muldahara also, to me, very much has to do with the relationship that you have with your body. Um, and to get fully grounded in understanding that your body is actually this, this beautiful temple, like you know, you said it houses the Shishuna from which everything has to rise up so that you can get to this level. The, the acceptance of the body, the relationship that you have with the body, the way that you feel about yourself, that grounding in your ability to know that you are safe to be here, that you have the right to take up room, that you have a right to be here, right? Isn't that, that is the right of the first chakra of your, of your Muladhara, is that you have a right to be here. And that you have that sense of safety and security that you have in your tribe. Um, without that, nothing else really matters. It's like that has to come in first. Or if, if it doesn't, if you just go straight up to here, then there is no, um, there's, no, uh, there's no true essence to it. Like you said, it's, it becomes more of a delusional space. It's not anchored in anything that's earthy or it's not anchored in anything that's truth is not anchored in your ability to understand yourself as a human because right. we are humans and it's like you got to understand yourself as a human uh, in the relationships that you're in how you interact with other people um the foods that you in, in other words everything that's material 
if you take out the material from the spiritual, then the spiritual doesn't have anything to really anchor itself into. And it becomes meaningless in your human experience because your spiritual experience should bring more meaning, more depth to your human experience. It shouldn't take you away from your human experience. In, in other words, it's not a form of escapism. Right. And that's what it can become if it's not anchored into the body, anchored into how it can actually help you live a better life as a, uh, as a human being. If it's not helping you, you know, have a good relationship with your body or if, you're, if your body's falling apart or if your relationships are falling apart or if your finances are falling apart, then this stuff hardly matters. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like this, this needs to help you with this. Absolutely. Otherwise, there's really no purpose of it. No point. That's why you were born. That's why you were, you were incarnated to know yourself as both human and spirit. So we're spirit already. I mean, we're, we didn't have to be born to be spirits. Spirit is who we are. Uh, we're born to be human, to be <laughs> like, in, we're born to be embodied. And that is like the, the, the very Tantra. That's the philosophy of Tantra too, is to be an embodied spirit or to spiritualize the body, to bring together both uh, spirit and matter. And that's also the, the foundation of hermeticism. Yeah. By the way, hermeticism is just the West. It's just the Western esoteric, uh, uh, philosophy that the Easterners, the Tantra philosophies practice just with a different language. Yeah. It's, um, it's embodied spirit or spiritualizing the body, bringing it together so that you can live the best life for yourself and for others. And it comes back to service. Like once you are here in present and um, aligned with your own purpose and clarity, I mean, all these things matter. Purpose, matter, your purpose matters. Why, why am I here? And those are some of the questions that get lost when you're, you're too much in your head. You can't ground your purpose. You know what I mean? It's like your purpose never goes anywhere. It just stays up in this kind of delusional realm. And it never actually goes anywhere to, to, to be a service and, and to help other people. Absolutely. So, so it all has to come back to being in your body being in relationship with others, how can I help and serve others? It has to all come round again. So it's a it's a current that's going up and down. It's not just about being up here. It's like you you take it up, you take it down. You take it up, you take it down. You're moving the current through the body. It's not just staying in one place. Then your body, then you actually feel more fulfilled in life. You feel yeah. more satisfied. You feel accomplished. Okay. You feel like you're actually making a contribution that, you know, that you're living your legacy, that yeah. you are making a difference. And those are the things that in the end actually make us feel better yeah. as a person. Versus if you're not feeling better from... as a person, then your spirituality really doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah, I love that. I hope that answered your question. I <laughs> love that. Me, I I today. That anchored because that's, you know, you know, in the law of one, they talk a lot about how, your soul chooses, you know, the cause and the effect, the cause is the soul, the effect becomes the body, the soul chooses to create this experience or the Shiva or the Shakti, it creates this experience for refinement to have. And I know in the, in the Emerald Tablets, one of the, my favorite things in the Emerald Tablet that Thoth says, you know, let's, let's say like in the Emerald Tablet, Thoth talks about reptilians. He talks about lizard people. Like there's some really, really saucy stuff, spicy stuff in the drama in the Emerald Tablets. But the thing that I found most fascinating, probably because of my years of work, was when he said, you only know life because you know death. When you're in spiritual form, when you're without body, there's no creation because there's no understanding of life because there's no death. And that really hit home because that is what the purpose, the purpose of the body is to have that nervous system, is to have the 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 cause and effect the karma the friction of being human to have the the shadow work to have to go back and, and and navigate through that because that's what creates the refinement of the soul in the end but when you're when you're ignoring the body or when you've created this like gym mental gymnastics i've heard a lot of people say this well i'm a spiritual person so therefore i don't pay attention to my body 
well, then you're not a spiritual person because you, you look at India, all the great yogis of India are all the, they're all very in their bodies, right? They're very, how else do you think they're levitating? They can only levitate their body because they're in their body, right? Or, or I see this a lot. Now, I know I believe fully in past lives. I think most people actually do. But I also, and I know we pull karma over from past lives, but I find a lot that people get so obsessed with past lives and living there then that they forget to be here now. And it's like, no, 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 don't use that as a disassociation from the sensation of the now. Because you're not that, there. you're not there then, you're, you're now. Now you have to process this in this body. And, um, you know, I've said a lot, Cindy, too, and I, and I want to clarify this as well. So when, so the bundas for people who are new, so the most people know what the chakras are, but just if you don't know, it's seven points in the body that represent different energetic cycles that cycle through. But a lot of people are not familiar, surprisingly, or have no clue what the bundas are. But in my opinion, Cindy, the chakras cannot exist without the bundas and the bundas cannot exist really without the chakras they they make each other kind of move and so i would describe the bundas you have three ones that you're working with jalandhara is in your throat it's tucking your chin in Udiyanda is in your belly button. It's pulling the belly button up and back. So the energy is coming up the spine. And then Muladhara, which our Mulabunda rather, is the Mac Daddy to, to me because it's the most interesting. It's basically in your crotch. It's in your perineum. And it's this lock. It's a lock of the perineum. It's a lock of the belly button. So if we're talking about that Kundalini energy rising up, what's pulling it up is actually that, per that, that perineum pulling up into that strength basically in your crotch right um do you have anything you want to add to that cindy about the for people understanding what these bundas are yeah they they it's like you said it helps to pull it's an upward udiana udiana actually means upward moving so it helps to pull the prana upward and the interesting thing about mulabana you're talking about for the, the pelvic floor is a that the pelvic floor, like that, the actual physical pelvic floor, is such an interesting area because mm -hmm. uh, to get Mula Bunda going to get it going effectively, you know, we, we do hold the tension. There's some people that hold tremendous amount of tension in their pelvic floor. Yeah. And usually the tension that's held in the pelvic floor is unconscious tension. And this is, you know, now going back to the, the energetics of what your chakras represents and the Muladhara, which is your base chakra, your root chakra. You know, again, your right to be here, your safety, it feeds down into the legs, into the hips, into the pelvic floor. But uh, how uh, unconscious tension gets caught up in the pelvic floor, you don't even realize how much we're like over, over pulling up. But, but then it's done in an unconscious way. And then it's just like a, this, this gripping, this tension that's coming from, you know, some kind of fear or, uh, or protection. And to get good mulabanda, it's almost like you have to release the, the 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 held tension first. It's like the first process is becoming aware of your pelvic floor, which is a weird thing to become aware of in the in the first place. It's like you got to take your mind's eye to the pelvic floor, and then starting to do the work of undoing the unconscious tension that's there, that's the gripping, the holding, the fear patterns, the the shame or the guilt or whatever, you know, we, we clench in the pelvic floor. It was like, you got to undo that first and then redo the, the mula bandha to where it's conscious upliftment, like a conscious upliftment, a conscious connection that you're making with that area uh, for it to have the proper effect of the, the rising of the Kundalini. Whereas if, which is why, you know, the yoga is so important where you're doing all of the, the movement first, like the hip yeah. work, the, the, um, and anything else that you do, even the core work that you yeah. do when you're pulling up through the belly and everything that you're doing to bring you awareness to how that's holding within your body and to notice if there is like this gnarly gripping that's going on there and getting the movement to undo that first so that the mulabanda can be truly effective in creating that upliftment of the of the pot or the shakti or the yeah. chi or whatever you want to call it through the body the crotch punch as i call so, it <laughs> it's uh <laughs> yeah 
it's it's that control. It's 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 that taking your power back. And and that, I'm glad you brought that up because mm -hmm. I want to talk about that because I remember. And and for those watching, like this is I want to make this clear too because I think sometimes I know I forget to say this. As long as you're alive and breathing, this is something you're forever going to be working on. There's no like finish line. It's constantly rediscovering and re-experimenting with this. And so. I remember years ago, before I'd ever went to India, I was doing a pranayama class with David Greek, my original Ashtanga teacher, and he, and pranayama is, is a bitch, like the, the proper, like, I mean, I think I've seen the light of God in a more stressed out state. <laughs> I've seen the light like of death in, in pranayama class way more than I've seen in asana class. But he had this like in that the Jalandhara Bunda guys that and pranayama is the extension of life force. It's the breathing that also generates that as well, the same type of sensation. And that's when you're using a lot of the Jalandhara Bunda too, when you're tucking in to open up the back of the throat. And he had us like bring with the exhale, try to bring the exhale as low as we could into our pelvic floor. I couldn't do it. I couldn't even get my mind to go there. And that's when I realized how much trauma was there. And it's not, I think it's every culture. I think every culture, I can't name one culture in the world that doesn't have some level of, of conservativeness or, or, or tabooness around this area of the body for both men and women. And it took me a really long time to first understand it, that there was that there was something there that I was missing. Um, when I was mm -hmm. up in Philadelphia, we'll get into the physicality of it. But, you know, at one point, David was like, you're not even using your legs. Like you're going through your whole practice just using your arms. And so he would have me do my practice up against the wall, pressing my feet against the wall to get my legs, which we'll talk about in a minute. We'll talk about what the legs have to do with it. Um, just to get my, and then all of a sudden things started shifting in my practice and it, things got easier because all of a sudden, you know, just in a very practical sense, my legs were actually doing stuff now. Um, but we'll, and we'll talk about that soon. But, um, then in 2016, I know I've told this story before I broke my sacrum and I had a choice to make. I could either throw a pity party and quit, or I could reevaluate how I did things. And that's when I found Cindy suggested it ballet. My friend, um, Chris up in Canada suggested bar class and it took me a while to find the teacher that I really liked. But when I started to do this work, that's a little bit different from yoga. It's got the same purpose. In my opinion, I was like, oh my God, there it is. And it took that restructuring of the same concept. And then it totally shifted my practice again. It, that breaking my sacrum was like the best thing that ever happened to me because it absolutely, I was laughing at 41 um, I've said it at Sacred Garden. My when my when I when I can get my boyfriend to adjust me, normally he won't. But when I can get him to, he always makes comments about how my body feels very different than it did at 31, right? Because there's more. I have more awareness <clears throat> of, of that. Well, that's what an injury does. That too. I mean, injury basically is the, it, on, on some level, it's just designed to redirect you. Yep. No, so injury is not always there to you know, be a pain in the ass, although it is, but it's just telling you that something needs to be redirected. Yeah. And that's exactly what you did. You, you had an injury again, you could have used it uh, as an excuse to whatever, but you redirected your thing. You just knew that something had to be redirected. And once you realign yourself to, to where that's going, then yeah, I mean, that's where all the difference happens, where the change happens, where the shift happens. Everything yeah, opens so, up. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. got that my, my core got stronger. And so I and, and again, you guys, like when we're talking about and my my mom's family, they're from the coast of South Carolina. And I whenever I talk about like the the foundation of Molabunda, I always get this image in my head. Count houses on the coast of South Carolina or Florida, a lot of the Atlantic coast, because Atlantic, the Atlantic is a very sassy ocean. It's a very sassy ocean. It's very powerful, right? Um, and they're all built. You you see these mansions up on stilts and the stilts are there for like high tide for really rough weather so that that doesn't knock the house down now growing up there that's just what i'm used to but as i got older and i'd be being bring friends or boyfriends would come to south they would always be weirded out by the fact that these mansions were like up on these stilts like how are these stilts holding up this house well it's because the foundation of the stilts is sturdy enough so that when the high tide comes, now hurricanes, sometimes the hurricanes might take the roof off, but those stilts are still standing strong. And that's what I think of with Mola Bunda, also like the root of a tree. When a tree is firmly rooted in the earth, 
the wind can come and it will move with the wind, but it rarely gets uprooted. It has to be a pretty gnarly thing for it to get uprooted. And that's Molabunda. And um, I guess we could kind of get into the physicality because this is not, and I'll use, because you're a dancer too, Cindy. You know, one thing too I'll say about, I love all the fancy Sanskrit words. I think they sound witchy and cool, but sometimes it's better to explain these things from a very practical perspective because they're almost every athlete out there is using Molabunda as well as dancers. You know, what I often say, you know, when you start to get into the physical body and steadiness, so you're talking about, you know, finding that steadiness first cool. and the steady, the rest of your body can sway and move. Um, you know, something that I often say just to clients that I'm working with or, or you know, to students is it's, it's where you want to, to redirect your safety because our, we're always, there's a part of us that is uh, in protective mode. But what happens is sometimes we direct the energy of safety and protection. And the way I see or the way I feel, it, especially when working with different bodies, you know, through the work that I do, is the, that, that sense of protection and safety is just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, your heart will often put in this, the, the, this a sense of safety, like in the heart area. But the heart isn't really where safety belongs. You know what I mean? Like your heart is a place, it's very really opposite of that, actually. The heart is vulnerable. The yeah. heart is open. It's reciprocity. It's where giving, the line of giving and receiving come out through the heart. And this is not where safety goes. This is not where protection goes. It shouldn't be here. If it does, it closes off the heart. But Instead, where can you redirect the safety to where it's actually going to uh, provide your body what it needs to be more open and free, but yet steady? You redirect the safety down into your legs, your legs, your butt, your, yeah. your I mean, think about the, the muscles that you have. You have a tremendous amount of muscles in the legs because, you know, they have to move the big bones around. But yeah. think about the size of the muscles in your quads. The size of your muscles, the size of your muscles and your quadriceps, the size of your glutes, your hamstring, or excuse me, your calves, they can take the anchor. They can take the safety. So if you want to feel safe, take it out of here. Like, take it out of here. Let this be, like, open and free and more fluid and put the safety down where it belongs, like, Get it, move it down into the legs. Now, that's going to require you, you know, probably when you're doing the work to move through. We're talking about some of the, the trauma that, that kept you from anchoring in the first place. So, you know, part of that work is also recognizing or at least there's another okay, there's another unconscious belief that a lot of us have. We don't realize is that we don't feel like our bodies is a safe place to inhabit. And so we directly go out of body because, you know, maybe we in, in our younger lives, we had, you know, some traumatic experiences. And what we did to to uh, to help get us through to cope is to disassociate, is to come out of the body. And then somewhere within the languaging of our minds, we decided that our body was not a safe place to inhabit. So it's like first, you know, making peace with the body that this is what you've been given. And you can't, you're, you know, it was given to you from your first breath and you're going to take it with you until the last breath. You really can't escape your body no matter what you do. You can try to, but, you know, coming to peace with the fact that your, your body's here for you, your body's not against you, it's here for you and making it a safe place again. Yeah. And then bringing that safety back down, like anchoring that safety and bringing it down into the legs and down into your butt and down into your hips and anchoring it and, and giving that firmness and that structure and those stilts that you were talking about down to where it's supposed to go, to where it needs to go, because our the, the lower part of, of our body can handle that. It can take that. It can take a hit, you know, and yeah. then the rest of you can be more free. But it, yes, it all begins with the relationship that you do have with the body. Does it feel like a safe place for you to inhabit? Can you move that safety down? into where it's supposed to like where it belongs within your body and then it helps to clear up uh everything else and you know so i you know i've done body uh videos on body morphic disorder which i have struggled with i have 
I love you're saying this too, because maybe it for me, it's also getting older as well, but I've been that sick kid. I was sick a lot growing up. I've hated mm-hmm. my body. I've been mean to mm-hmm. my body. I've, but when, and, and that, uh, that existed through a lot of my Ashtanga practice too. Oddly enough, there is a lot of Ashtanga people who have disordered eating. You know, you see that a lot, but again, when it came back to that, I was 33 years old, 2016 broke my sacrum. When I started to really incorporate the bar, which was actually incorporated more Molabunda work, what started off just to strengthen my sacrum back, now at 41 years old, I freaking love my body. I feel sexy. Mm-hmm. I love what it's been through. I love all my scars on my body because I earned those suckers. You know, I, I look at my my legs and I say this in class sometimes, like the femur bone specifically, the femur bone is like the strongest bone in your body and it takes a lot. Like if you break your femur, femur bone, I want to hear the story because you probably like skied into a tree or something or were hit by a Mack truck because it takes a lot to break the femur bone, the thigh bone, the quadriceps, you know, and the inner thigh, which a lot of the work that we do with Molabund involves the inner thigh, which we'll get to. Sometimes the quadriceps, because they're so big, they'll take over from the inner thigh, but that inner thigh, that's where all that magic, but but these beautiful quadriceps, they're so willing to to help, you know? And so it, it, it and that pers- that shifted in me it wasn't a, it wasn't something, it wasn't a goal I had. Literally, when I started doing this other work, it was just to strengthen my sacrum again so I could get back on my mat, right? That was all it was. But it turned out that everything in my life shifted. And so, and it's not, you know, as I was saying, this mullah, this mullah bundle work that we do can be done in so many different forms of exercise. Because in my opinion, even though I practice Ashtanga yoga, which is one of the most dogmatic yoga practices, I really think that this work can be found in any form of movement. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Cindy, but like we see it in dance. We see it in long distance runners. We see it in in football players. We see it in all sorts of different movements. There can be spirituality like this and everything involving the movement of the body. Correct? Would you say? Well, it's in your anatomy. It's it's a built into your anatomy here. So it's it's built into the physical body, the, the possibilities to access that kind of power it's built into anybody's anatomy system. And it just depends on what kind of languaging you, you use, you know? So it depends on, uh, on, on you know, so, so people who are very much into sports, they're, they're saying a lot of the same things, but they're just using more anatomical language or, you yeah. know, dancers in the same way. I mean, they have to use their inner thigh. They have to use Mulabanda, but they're not calling it that because there's no way you can do those, even basketball players, the ones that do those tremendous leaps, yep. you know, the, the dancers that leap, that that comes from that upward, that learning how to access right. that upward movement to give you lightness and the muscles and all the deep internal work to give you that lift. They might not, you know, call it mulabanda or call it, you know, you know, anything spiritual, but the, what's happening regardless of the language is they're connected to their purpose. Yeah. You know, well, they're yeah. connected to to their passion. They're connected to uh flow. to their body. And they might not, yeah, to flow. And they might not call it a, a, a spiritual thing, it's just different languaging. But in the end, again, just going back to what we were saying at the beginning, it's all about tapping into that legacy and serving and feeling like you're on purpose. Um, you know, a basketball player or a football player or a ballerina, you know, again, they'll just use different languages. Like if you hear like true, ba- the ballerinas or the basketball, the ones that are in the, in their, um, their, their power with it, you know, they use their own power words. They'll tell you, oh, I, I, there's nothing else that I would rather be doing. Mm-hmm. You know, this is my passion. I feel like, you know, I could do this for, for, for hours and days and they're aligned with their purpose and in the end that's what spirituality is about it's it's not just about whatever all this you know fantasy I mean, it's and about and yeah. you living living your legacy like living your purpose and aligning yourself with that and the people who have connection with that type of power within their body they're doing that automatically like olympic olympic swimmers olympic medalists 
thick as I mean, they are automatically connected to their their legacy, to their purpose, to you know, to their passion, to their connection with life and why I'm here. They're connected to that. They're being alive. Uh, my friend mm-hmm. Jamie Soleil, who is an Olympic figure skater, I've often thought, you know, like when we look at, and I love how like that taking off, but in order, you know, even in all sports, in order to physically jump up and do the layup or whatever, they have to go down first. It's a literal going down mm-hmm. or it's not just coming up, you know, and I right. think about my friend Jamie Soleil, who did couples, the gold medalist, and to be able to be thrown up into the air by her partner with these heavy skates on, twirl and land that's molabunda that's strong you know Mm -hmm. um we see when the ballerina like leaps across the stage and makes it look easy and if you have a still shot of a ballerina in that moment every single muscle in her his or her body are engaged you can see the muscles engaged because they're they're alive and they're moving in that that and then when they land they land softly because that's that control, mm-hmm. right? It's not a thump. And we say that a lot in Ashtanga, like with the jump backs and the jump throughs. If you thunk with a jump back, then you've lost malabunda because there needs to be that control. And you're right, because when I started doing these bar classes, they don't call it malabunda. That's not what they're calling it. But I knew that's what it was because I had been studying this. And I was like, oh, wow. Wow, this is what they're doing. It. They're not calling it. They're calling it pelvic tucks. They're calling it, you know, but mm-hmm. like I, this is molabunda. That's what this is. So again, it's like accessing. Yeah, and I was gonna say this is that accessing to your to your place of personal po- power, where in the end, what it provides you on all the levels, it's beyond just physical. You know, it's like you are connected at that moment to something bigger. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it, because it because it is all about you know going back to the anatomy, it's about that physical alignment mm-hmm. and being able to channel and take in and receive, not only receive but then to um, to what's the word I'm looking for? It's like you receive the information, but then you recode it or you, like, you re- or redistribute it. You to make, make it do what you want it to way. do. You're manipulating in uh-huh. a positive way. Like you're in control. You are the alchemist. You are the sorcerer. You're able to take that energy and, um, you know. But you have to like, a, yeah, get yourself in alignment to it yes. first. Align it through the body, through the mulabunga, through whatever to receive it. Mm-hmm. And then once you receive it, you, you know, you, yeah, Perfect. you decode it or whatever to, to get it to do what you want it to do, whether it's, uh, 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 again, a ballet dancer or if you're just cooking or if you're a musician or you know whatever it is but it's uh, the whole purpose of it is to to get you in in that alignment of being receptive and receiving and um then you know learning what to do with it and some people just do that na- or, or i don't know if they naturally i mean some of them might have it naturally some of them put a lot of practice into it, like, you know, any musician or Olympic yeah. medalist, they put a lot of practice into it. And just like we put practice into it, it's, you know, they might not call it a spiritual practice, but in our language, it totally is a spiritual practice. Totally. Well, because you're about- learning how to be in flow with life. That is yeah. spiritual practice altogether, is learning how to be in flow with life and then using that life to, you know, to, to, live. to manifest into what you want to do, to live. And that's and so alive. there's so many people that do that without that, the spiritual talk. Well, that kind of brings us full circle back to the beginning, too, because like that dancer that's leaping across the stage or that basketball player and musicians, too. I mean, you watch like piano players like your son, they're using their feet to control the pedals, the whole mm-hmm. body. You watch their body is controlled and they're, it's moving with the flow of the music. A drummer is a good example. Yes. You watch a drummer's body. They're constantly pulling up. Yeah, that's why Mm -hmm. most of them are are very got a six pack, right? Because they're constantly like pulling up, um, and and that's that moment. Like we we talked about in the beginning, like a lot of times in this pop spirituality, people want to leave the the experience of the body. They want to get out of the experience of the body. But in these moments of of being that drummer or being that swimmer or being that piano player, that dancer, you're in that moment of being alive. Right, everything mm-hmm. else has and left. It has to go through the body. Your yes. body is actually the the um, conduit, hand, the, the the instrument. Yes, the conduit. Exactly, it's the conduit from which the artistry can come through. 
Yeah. And, and, the, and people understand that like the, the ones who are living life that way, they understand that even if they don't talk about it, it's like they have a visceral understanding that this has to come through my body. Like it's this artistry needs to come through. And so therefore they naturally understand their body as the conduit for life. And, and that I, in essence is the root, you know, a lot of the, not just the root, but then you're going into the second chakra too, especially when you're yeah, talking I was about gonna the say, movement, the creativity, creativity, the creativity yeah, of it. Absolute creativity. Mm -hmm. And the third, the that. power, which brings, we'll get to that too. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. But even like, yeah, you're right. Cause like your son, when he plays the piano, he doesn't just sit down and just point out notes. No, he, he fix like we come to Psalmist DT. He, he has to set his body up, set his feet up. His whole oh, yeah. body becomes, if you watch a pianist, their arm muscles move. They're sitting up. They're not slouching. They're sitting up. My grandmother, though, used to tell a story when she would play the piano. She'd get quarters put on her, her uh, knuckles. Her aunt taught her. Her mean aunt that she used to say and if, if the quarters fall off she get whacked with the ruler but the, the body is totally you watch i mean one of my favorite bands to watch old bands to watch is acdc because that guitarist mm -hmm. like he just he is one with his guitar and it is a physical yeah physical it's, they're channeling yes yeah they don't realize it, but it's like they're they're like channeling you know maybe, something bigger maybe, than themselves <laughs> Maybe that's why it's easier for them because they take away the expectation of spirituality. They're just doing it. Mm -hmm. There's, they're just, exactly. Well, it's good enough for rock and roll. They just do it. The dancer just dances, mm -hmm. right? I think sometimes maybe we, that's funny. I say maybe we overthink it as yoga because the second sutra is yoga, mm -hmm. to Rodaha, which Patanjali is literally like you're overthinking. <laughs> so maybe, maybe yeah. that's why they have such a higher rate of success is because they don't overthink it. They just do it. And um, yeah, they're just being, they're being, they're, they understand here. Um, I mean, their practice is understanding their instruments, mm -hmm. whether it's the body or whatever instrument. And they have a very, very specific, usually a very specific goal in mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you have a very specific goal in mind, that's the, the yoga part of focusing the mind. Yeah. Because in your mind, it is distracted by all of these other things. It's very focused. And that's what the, the whole third uh, the third part of the third chapter of the yoga mm -hmm. sutras is, is about, I mean, they talk about you focus everything and you can pretty much become an expert at anything. Yeah. Like you have the, the capacity to, to hone it in on any superpower that you want. If you focus your mind and that's what the, these artists or, or these, these people that, you know, you're, you're just in awe of, that's what they can do. It's they have their natural, yeah, they have the the capacity, I'm not saying that all natural because they trained themselves. They have a goal. It's like they very much focus their attention on this is who I want to be and this is what I want to do. And they take every single bit of that attention of that life and focus it through for it to come out. Yeah. You know, so I love it's, that. It's not just it's not just like spiritual talk. And yeah, I think maybe that we can, you know, over overthink it maybe overly spiritualize it when it's really just living life to your fullest that's what it doing comes it. down to maybe nike, <laughs> maybe nike has it all summed up just do it like just do it you know and you guys right. have not read the yoga sutras the third and fourth pada are wild they're fun <laughs> they're, they're, the first two he's like you suffer because xyz now do this do that now let's talk about the cities let's talk about the fun but it is yeah, but right. you need the first two padas to learn how to to incorporate that in order to get to that place of, of total. And that's what Guruji used to say. You know, we say, oh, yoga is yoking and joining all these things. But Guruji used to say, it's just focus. All yoga is, is focus. Mm -hmm. It's focused attention. And one thing about, now you guys, if you're, I'm sure some of you are aware, um, we, I've just now started, I, I literally learned so much from my experience, what I thought was just going to be something I was going to going to do for a short amount of time to get my practice back has turned out to be a practice that's so freaking important to me because it's changed my life just as much as Ashtanga has changed my life. And I started to incorporate this stuff into like when we would have a moon day and because we don't teach ashtanga on moon days and so if by chance i was scheduled and it was a moon day we would do some of these practices in the class with cindy and everybody else because i thought this is just so 
good. I can't, I need to share this. And so we've now just started doing a Wednesday morning class at 6.30 a.m., a yoga fusion class where we're doing a lot of the stuff that I learned in the bar sequencing. And I want to talk about too, a little bit about the, the anatomy. And the reason why we focus so much on the legs is because the legs are really are the root of Mullabunda. And one thing, everybody watching right now, your big toe, if you follow the inner thigh, pressing into the big toe, that's carrying that energy up the inner thigh into the crotch. And I already knew that because as an Ashtanga teacher, I can't, Cindy would fire me, I can't <laughs> go in my class and crotch check people to see if Mola Bund is engaged. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that, but that would just be weird. <laughs> they do it in India and it's not weird in India, but in America, it would be weird. So how I can see a student, a student's progress with understanding the shape, the alchemy of the shape and the bunda, the potency is I look at their toe, their feet. If their toes coming off the mat, I can see there's there's a there's something is disengaged. And I can I sometimes I'll go and I'll step on the person's foot, not like heart, but I'll push my foot on just to get their toe to press down so that they can activate into the inner thigh. Well, something that the bar does, the bar classes do that we do in the yoga fusion class that we don't get to do in yoga that that often, I've never done it in yoga, is we come to the balls of our feet. We come to the balls mm -hmm. of our feet and we bend our knees and we put a prop in between our thighs, like a ball or a block. And that forces that, that forces that, that focused attention on the stability mm -hmm. of the body. Cause the body's trying to always find that stability, right. To really get that energetic connection up through of course, when you're holding that block as well. And so that's why these practices with the, the legs, even though they're only the root of Malabunda, that's the root is where it all begins. It's where you have access to really understanding that pulling up of that pelvic floor. If that does that make sense? Yeah, and I've been refining my inner thighs too on a different level. I didn't realize how you know you think you're connected to your 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 legs or your bodies, but then you go to you find something new or a mm -hmm. new nuance, and then you realize. I wasn't connected at all, <laughs> but, um, <Your> perception. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Um, yeah, the, yeah, it's great. That access to the inner thighs that you could, we've been working on some inner thighs in this uh, past week and our yoga class as well. And I've been, you know, summoning the, 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 and I think you have to, the, the great sage of the 1980s, Suzanne Summers, who was ahead of her time, and she understands, she understood Hi, master. the purpose of the inner thighs. She knew it. She, she was onto something. Go find your thigh master, guys. Go, go find that thigh master. That is going to help you find Mullabunda real fast. Real fast. <laughs> exactly. But the positioning of your uh, pelvis, Mm -hmm. makes a difference in the how yeah. well you can access your inner thighs because if you have too much of a like a, a tilt like an yeah. anterior tilt in your pelvis it won't allow you to find the access and to push through the inner thigh so the, the or, or if you have too much of that posterior where your hips are forwardly thr thrusting yeah. but without any connection to your lower abdominals that can also make you lose access to your inner thighs so the positioning of your pelvis and how you're using your belly to position your pelvis can also help to give you that that mulabunda access, that rooting down, but then that also pulling up oh that God. that gives you the access and the focus uh, to um, to to your power. But all these little details. This is you know where we could totally nerd out. Yeah, but all these little nuances, all these little details um, make a difference. And it just goes to show you how how uh, how much is stored within the body, how much unstored or not unstored, like un maybe unfulfilled potential is within the body, but how much potential we have access to if we do the work um, to actually find it and to connect it. It's all there. To you just it. gotta find it. I mean, it's literally you've been right. Exactly. exactly. It's all there. That's you just gotta the find the right movement, the right alignment to to yeah. get that. That's the good mm -hmm. news. You you came here with all the tools. You just gotta you. And again, mm -hmm. it's a lifelong practice. And that's I actually work a lot, and I tell the students every Wednesday. I say this a lot, especially when we have new students. Like. The, the practice we do on Wednesday morning can stand as its own practice. But my intention mm -hmm. is to give them full on 
pra uh, an hour's worth of practice into this area of their body so that they can then incorporate that into their yoga, into whatever else they're doing in their life. And we do a lot of those tucks because you're right, it's that pelvis. It's being able mm -hmm. to move. It's not just, you know, and that's one thing I say a lot too, Cindy. Like yoga is not about flexibility. Yoga is about mobility, which is that control. It's an openness with control. It's being able to open the hip, but also control the openness of the hip, being able to manipulate in a positive way. Well, it it gives power. you access. The, that, yeah. the, the important of the mobility work is it gives you access to more of your potential. Because yes. if you're locked up, you don't. You just won't have access to it no. until you no. unlock yourself. So it's I like mean, everything gives you access to deeper parts of you. And that's you know the reason. And then, and then when you do have access to more of your own potency and your own power, your own mobility, your own movement, your own strength, that uh, it fuels you not just physically, but mentally, spiritually as well, because you, you feel like, like you're in control, like you, like you have some momentum or you're like you're in control of your life instead of everything being just like seized and locked up and hidden yeah. and protected. Well, and that goes into <laughs> the second chakra as well. We are going to say creativity because like in Ashtanga, we don't listen to music that's actually against the rules right because they they view in this lineage they view that music can distract you from what you're doing and it would just be kind of weird because it's on a it's on a certain beat but in the class i teach on wednesday i rely on the music because when you're in these positions and you're having to bounce up and down in a controlled way i tell the students about like i'm like find the beat your body knows the beat find the beat find that natural primal instinct but that comes to that second chakra, that creative, where you can move with with the with the expression of what you're hearing as well. So it's incorporating the full simulation of you being alive in that moment. And I often tell them too, because strength work. I mean, that's what it is, guys. It's it's you know Wednesday morning we do a little bit of the the, the stretching or the yoga. But I always say, listen, you're doing you're do, you're stretching all week in all the classes in yoga. Let's focus really hard on the strength in this class, you know, um, to really help you find that. Ugh, that 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 crotch punch so that when you go to do your handstands and yoga or your drop backs you have more more access to what it is you're actually looking for anyway and um yeah it's uh, it's 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 I, I tell them though because i always say you know make this the hardest thing you got to do today because in the rest of the days you're going to be great right like find the, the raw strength and i tell them too that emotion like sometimes when we we dig deep into mula bunda and we get and we're shaking our muscles are shaking and we're dropping lower and we're squeezing the block and we're shaking we feel that rage come up and i tell the students let it come up drop a few f-bombs if you have to find it find mm -hmm. that area that that anger did someone piss you off this week did something piss you off as a child is that memory come up find, be there with it but it's okay to have that rage. It's okay to find that human experience. You're not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, all you're doing is you're in your, you're in a class. You're not gonna hurt anybody with it, but this is a healthy way of, of literally exercising. That's why exercise is the root word of exorcism of exercising that which does not serve you anymore and strengthen that which does serve you. And the more you can ground into that, the more then you can have access to the that's why the third and fourth pata are the third and fourth pata and not the first and second pata right, right. you got you have to you got to start you with the whole, you got to train it you got to start you have to understand the basics yes right he didn't start with the cities and actually like an in indian no. you know you get your yoga sutra book and you got they don't hide anything it's there it, they, 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 it all comes together the third and fourth chapter are there but they always say oh wait 10 years wait 10 years and then we'll look at the third and like do 10 years of first and second and work first consistently yeah, and then we'll do then we'll talk about the third and fourth. You can read it, but I'm not going to teach it to you until you actually completed about 10 years of, of, of consistent practice. Well, that kind of, and then of course, as this, as the solar plexus and the stomach gets stronger, because it's going to just naturally, that's going to strengthen your, the Manipura, your third chakra, which is like your willpower. And that, that brings mm -hmm. that, you know, you stand, it's kind of like you, st you, you, you stand up taller. You don't shrink down when you've got that secure, you know, so the physical and the spiritual are literally one and the same when you're in this existence. They, they One cannot exist without the other. And so I wanted to kind of go through some of these questions. Um, and now before we get, I've, I've already let, we've already talked about some of these questions beforehand, guys. But, um, 
you guys know I talk a lot about how exercise and spirituality come hand in hand. And the first question was a great question. Now, I want to make this clear before we get into it. When I, when I talk about exercise and spirituality going hand in hand, I'm not saying you have to be an Olympic athlete. I'm not saying no. you have to train so hard that you're going to have a 12 pack, right? Take a walk. Start with just taking a 30 minute walk, you know, get your body, get your energy moving because we have this concept. And I think this gets confused a lot in the Western world. It's called Hatha. And a lot of people in, uh, in America say Hatha. It's not Hatha, guys, because the TH doesn't make the th sound in Sanskrit. It's Hatha, which is like sun, moon. So what is the sun? It's prana. What is the moon? It's an apana. So hatha is like juggling energy. It's basically, it comes from this book. And can I say this real quick too? The hatha is interesting that you say sun and moon because like in the astrology words, the sun is spirit and the moon is matter. Oh, and wow. That's also what I feel what we're doing is yeah. we're talking about spiritualizing the body you know it's the it's divine the tango spirit you're spiritualizing the matter you're spiritualizing the body you're bringing the sun and the moon the spirit and matter into one form here and that that's what we're in the end trying to become anyways yeah. go ahead yeah, i love that i <laughs> so, love that it's the divine tango mm -hmm. Well, so many people in the mm -hmm. West get this hatha, this hatha or hatha, as they say, thing confused. And they'll say, I teach hatha yoga. That's person's vinyasa. And I'm like, no, no, no. Any type of movement, any type of movement is hatha. Going to run is hatha. Mm -hmm. Going for a swim is hatha. Because it's just you. The And if you really wanted a fun read, the hatha yoga pradikapa. Now, it's only going to be interesting and fun to people who are nerds like Cindy and me. But it's actually... There's some comical stuff in there. Like, for example, they tell you, and they still do this in India, that you should only wash your shala with cow dung. That's fun. Um, and they talk about how your, your shala, do the door to your shala, your yoga school should be really low so that you have to duck to come in. And, I, and I, I'd always read that, but I kind of skimmed over it. And I remember Lakshmi, my Sanskrit teacher, asking, like, do you guys know why that is? And no one said anything. And it was like, so you have to bow before God. Like, duh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, duh. Yeah. Duh. <laughs> you have to bow before you even enter. Before you yeah. enter. And none of the and the, the, the doors in India now are their average size, but I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting. But the Pradikapa, it's all about these yoga asanas or these yoga poses and like what they're doing. They also talk about how, because at this point when it was written, it was only males who practice, so you're not supposed to fraternize with women. That was that's in the Pradikapa. And also it tells you that vegetables are bad for you. So there's some some maybe not not correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's like a two thousand year old book, guys. You should eat rice, like eat, eat carbs, like you know, so anyway but but that's where that comes from so when we get to this idea of exercise being a part of spirituality that's besides the bundas which go go into hatha that's what i'm referring to it's you understanding your life force you being able to move in your body it's a hatha and so i also that kind of leads us to the first question but i do want to also say just on a very practical level again I don't expect any of my students to be athletes. I don't expect them to what their body is able to do, what they look like in their body is not what impresses me. What impresses me is their behavior and their character. Just going to put that. I've seen it all. Cindy's seen it all. I've seen if, if you've seen one leg go behind someone's head, you've seen all right. Like if you've seen one back bend, you've seen them all. Be a good person. That's what impresses me. And your hard work is what impresses me, too. Right. So with that being said, don't put added pressure on yourself when I say that. Just taking a 30 minute walk to begin with is really, really awesome and great. And it gets you sweating and get that energy. That sweat is that literal expression of that hatha of that movement of energy um second of all don't ever compare somebody's chapter 10 to your chapter one so people like cindy and myself have been doing this for years so of course you're going to see teachers who are going to look really fit in their clothes or having you know they've been doing this for a very 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 long time and you want your teacher Trust me, you want your teacher to be a few steps ahead of you, right? That's how they're able to kind of guide you. And, and also, you know, just to make it clear, Cindy, myself, other people that classes you go to, this is what we do for a living too. So it's not just our hobby, but it's also what we do for a living. So there's going to be a different, you're going to see, you know, if you're, if you're a, a lawyer or a doctor, you, you know, that's what you, you know, so it's going to be a different, you're going to see different 
expectations from different bodies. I also too, like for Cindy and me, we're adjusting students. So I want to bring that practicality into it too. Like I, when I used to teach Mysore, I would have to drop back men who are twice my size. So that level of fitness was also important to keep my body safe so that I didn't drop my student or hurt myself in the process of working with students. So don't ever compare yourself to the person who is teaching you or to anybody else in the room because you don't know what their backstory is. You only person you need to compare yourself is, is to you and what you're learning about yourself and the journey that you're on. I hope, does that make sense, Cindy? Because I get that a lot where people all of a sudden think they have to be like these marathon runner athletes. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I said. Does that make sense? Like, just yes, like you have to give yourself permission to be a beginner and give yeah. yourself permission to do crappy yoga. Yeah, crappy yoga. Listen, I, give yourself I love <laughs> messy yoga. Listen, pretty yoga is boring. Like we got to find it. Yeah. <laughs> Is, is this too pretty then i gotta do more work to make it make it make it harder for you mm -hmm. to get sloppy again because that's where it's interesting where it's sloppy is where it's interesting and well it's honest too yes it's vulnerable you no know, it's like this is just, this is where i am it's honest and this is what it looks like and that's what your teachers are there for they're help to you know helping to try to get you through those beginner parts and starting to to direct you where you want to go and yeah um, like give you give you some some direction say yes you know this is where you are it's beautiful it's great and be where you are but then you know trying to give them the direction of where they want to go yeah and we also see your well. blind spots too mm -hmm. we can see because mm -hmm. you know i can see when somebody's ego or their imagination is is taking over because it's happened to me like i can only recognize it like oh, yeah you only recognize what's in your so i know like i know for me you know when i'm doing my practice and i get to a part of my practice i don't particularly like all of a sudden i need to go change the laundry that's interesting isn't it like all of a sudden at four o'clock in the morning i got to go change the laundry no i'm just my mind's creating escape routes right my mind's creating that negotiation and so because i've dealt with that and i still deal with that cindy too as a teacher we're able to kind of recognize that in other people and help them stay on track you know be the compass well, for them to be able to take the journey yeah and especially well it happens it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or an advanced student but when the the ego gets in the way and then the ego gets embarrassed mm -hmm. like the ego might be embarrassed about oh you know i feel stupid here i can hardly do this or i'm you know i'm panting and i'm losing my breath and i'm all flustered and everyone else is doing just fine you know so, so our ego will come in and start to create the story about how you're not like enough or you're you're not you know or this is too much for me, or I shouldn't be here. But that's just the the ego trying to come in and and protect you from certain things. But part of the practice, especially as a beginner, is to get get through that. Like get past you gotta get past that and get past your humiliation or whatever it is that you're feeling, and just give yourself permission to be a very sloppy beginner <laughs> i will tell you guys and i'm sure cindy you can vouch for this as somebody who teaches and watches students all the time everybody's in there struggling so even if you oh, yeah that your classmates aren't struggling they're struggling even mm -hmm. the advanced students the ones that are hyper focused those are usually the more advanced students who've been practicing for longer because they know how to focus the mind but you can see it you can see it in their eyes you can see it in oh, their yeah. yeah there so don't ever feel like you're not and I, and I tell this to students too all the time everybody is so focused on their own shit basically they're not even paying attention to anybody else in the room i promise i promise you they're not so don't ever feel that way and i believe and my personal belief is you're always where you're supposed to be so if you find yourself mm -hmm. in a class and you're struggling and you're that negotiation is happening that mind chatter that monkey mind is happening and you're feel you're beating yourself up just remind yourself, mm -hmm. as my friend Tamara says, just be like, cancel, cancel. Thank you, but cancel, cancel. Mm -hmm. And remind mm -hmm. yourself that you're there for a reason. And nobody was born doing it. Like, as far as like the athletic, uh, we were all born being alive and having a body. But as far, as far as being the athletic perspective of this, no one was born doing it. We all were, mm -hmm. everybody, every teacher, we all started at one point point in our lives so just get that silly that silly talk out of your head get it out of your head so this brings us to a really really good question we got from one of our viewers 
Um, let's go back here. She said, Yes, I, I asked if any, I said, hey, y'all, do you have any questions about Moladara Molbunda exercise and spirituality? If so, ask below, working on a video now. And so we got this question. Yes, I have have a burning one. I hear you frequently say exercise is the foundation of spirituality. This leaves me wondering about people with disabilities or physical limitation that restrict their ability to exercise. How does this not exclude them from being spiritual, following a spiritual uh, path? They can be some of the most enlightened people out there. I'm just trying to understand how both things can be true. Um, thank you for your excellent work and dedication to all of us watching. And I said, really good question and super easy to answer. We will discuss this in the video. So I want to kind of go back to this, what, what you said here with disabilities and physical limitations. So everybody everywhere has physical limitations. Um, I have a really bad back. I've had back surgery. I have arthritis. We all have these limitations and as I say a lot, we don't work against these, we work with them. And it depends on what the disability is. Like somebody asked you had, a, um, my son has moderate se cerebral palsy, and I'm determined to help him figure out a way to move. Um, we and Carol, we and I, I answered this, we have a student at AYA who has cerebral palsy. And so let me just bring up this first, and then we'll get back to uh, to this question up here. I'll talk about the cerebral palsy first. I won't say his name. But we have this awesome student. We've had him at AYA for years now. He comes every single day and he has cerebral palsy. And he came to AYA because he had trouble with other yoga teachers because they didn't know how to help him. And because Ashtanga is my, mostly is Mysore style, he was recommended to try Ashtanga because he would be able to go at his own pace and the teacher would be able to, my boyfriend would be able to work with him one on one. Well, I have said since the beginning of this student coming to our, our shala, we have a lot of students at AYA who are practicing like advanced series A, third series. But in my opinion, the student in our shala who has cerebral palsy, who will never finish primary series, in my opinion, is the most advanced student at AYA. He comes into that shala every day. He's already got limitations. He's already got friction. And he comes in there with such a good attitude. And we've had to change the practice up a little bit. He has to work with props. When he comes to do his sun salutations, he has to, his one hand, which is not really working, he takes his other hand and pulls it up and then forward folds with it. So he works with his cerebral palsy. He doesn't work against it. And my boyfriend works with him. So for your son, I would say find a really good teacher or a trainer or someone who can work um, I follow, there's a gym I follow on Instagram, I think it's over in the UK, where they specifically cater to people with disabilities, specifically. So you can find resources to, now again, with any dis disability or f physical issue going on, once again, we're not asking you to be Olympic athletes at all. We're asking you just to move, just start moving, whatever that means for you. Now, let's say, and then I'll let you give your perspective too, Cindy. Let's say that you have, you're a quadriplegic. Let's say something's happened and you are like paralyzed. Well, what we've talked about is the focused mind, right? So I have seen it happen before and I have advised this before. Say you can't move your body doesn't mean you can't move your mind. Doesn't mean you can't lay there and go through a physical yoga, breathe yourself through in your mind's eye a yoga practice or watch a ballet class and try to bring yourself into breathing through the movements that you're seeing on screen and actually in your mind's eye, see yourself, feel yourself doing those movements, even if your physical body isn't moving. So there's always ways to work around it. There's always ways. And trust me, as teachers, I think, Cindy, you can, we want to know. I want to know if you have an injury. I want to know if you have a bad knee. I want to know if you've got something going on. I need to know that so that I can help you help yourself and work with it, not against it. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Cindy? Um, yes. Well, I do work with, uh, um, like, I have a client right now who uh, lost lost the whole function of her left side of the brain. She's young. She had a stroke. And I um, I see her. Um, she I knew her before that happened. Um, but what we do is we, we just sit and, you know, one of the things that um, we kind of talk about, or maybe I talk about because she can't talk right now, 
is you're you you still woke up today you know you woke up you're breathing and i know it's hard to figure out what the heck why you know we can get we and we can get really caught up on the fact of that we have this thing but for some reason you still woke up today you're still breathing and there's still a purpose for you i mean there's still a purpose here for you to to be here and to be alive and you know to focus on first of all to focus on that purpose so you know the people who have and, and sure that's easy for me to say <laughs> being fully functioned because i don't know what that's like but um but still you know it's 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 the things that even when i'm i'm having a hard day is you know to to redirect and focus your attention on the fact that i'm breathing i'm here alive i have a still a, a specific purpose whether it is uh to just you know heal myself better whether it is to wake up every day and try to get function and mobility back into my body and, and what it's like to to do that and, and what it's like to go through that process you know yeah. so i think for you know first that first part of it is kind of like you said it's just like that mental where is where is your mind and, and what is it focusing on and and, you know, and, and then some of the things that I've, and she's not the only one that I've worked with, um, with disabilities, but it's just coming back to like, what can you do? So you have disabilities, you have physical limitations, but instead of focusing on what you can't do, yeah, what can you do? Yeah. And let's work on, you know, what it is that you can do and what is your goal? what is your your purpose here for, for for being with me you know today like what is it that you want do you want to get more mobility back or you know what is it and then how can i help you you know with that um but i think a lot of it is just focusing on what you can do even if all you can do is you know this with one arm yeah absolutely yeah that you I, know I, I, or or, oh, or maybe this is hand. all you can do right now is turn your head from 100%. side to side what? and just come in as hard like i said i don't i don't i don't understand i don't know that challenge from a personal experience so i can't you know i can't begin to comprehend what that's like but you know just that idea of i'm still breathing i'm alive today I have the means I have purpose and I have value and how can I align myself with that and what I can do. Yeah. And I'll say too, I've told this story before, but I, I think it bears repeating, you know, again, in the Ashtanga practice, you see a lot of, it's one of the most, um, elaborate you know you see crazy posture Cirque du Soleil it's very intense and mm -hmm. so you walk into a Mysore room a lot especially if you're new it can be quite intimidating because you do see people standing up with their leg behind their head doing forward and back, ha back handsprings and I remember the one of the greatest lessons I learned from David Grieg and I repeat this a lot in the yoga class there are two lessons that in our at Sacred Garden I talk about this a lot there's two great lessons I learned from David but I, as I'd watch David who's one of the foremost most of the senior uh, Ashtanga teachers in the United States, he, you know, he would have these young girls in Philadelphia that were like in their early 20s who had been cheerleaders or gym gymnasts who had a lot of already had a lot of physical ability. And so they would kind of go through some of these asanas pretty quickly and get to more and more, more of the advanced asanas. And it, it never seemed and this is my perspective, like David never seemed to be too, too totally interested. Like it didn't really interest him that much. But, mm -hmm. however, when a 60, 70 year old man would walk in who was overweight and could hardly touch his toes, David would mm -hmm. get so excited because now, and I want you guys to remember this with your friends or your children or yourself, if you have a disability or a physical limitation or cerebral palsy, you have something to work with. You have something to actually work with. That's what David would say. These guys would come in, these old men who could hardly touch their toes. He'd be like, great, we have something to work with. 
Now we have resistance because that's what you're looking for, right? When you're looking for that friction, you're looking for resistance. Like that's going to create that, that sweat. And so if, if, you know, and I've, I've said this in our classes a lot, David would also say, if your karma, if you struggle in primary series, you are one of the lucky ones because your karma came up early. And trust me, I've been in India where I've seen these people who've had to get all the way up to like fourth series, advanced series B, which I've said many times looks like a fucking exorcism. If you watch it, it's disgusting. It's so, but I had, I've watched these people have such ease through first, second, third series, and they get to fourth series and all of a sudden they hit struggle and their world explodes. Whereas people who found the struggle in the beginning are usually understand yoga from a deeper perspective are humbler are white really have a deep um, understanding of wisdom so don't ever see disabilities or sicknesses or physical limitations i like how cindy said what what can you do not what can't you do wake up and be like yes i have something to work with i actually have I'm one of the lucky ones in that sense. Like, I'm not saying, you know, obviously I don't have a, I have a bad back and arthritis, but so I know what some pain is like in the practice, but, you know, change your perspective, change your perspective on what this is. You have something to work with, which is exciting. It's exciting. If you don't have anything to work with, then you have nowhere to go. But if you have something to work with, then you have so many possibilities in front of you. And so I would just really, I hope that makes sense. I would really encourage you guys to just, even if you're just a regular Joe, like Cindy and me, who if you just like, you know, are a little overweight or have a, you know, you know, we have that, we have a lot of people with that issue, right? There's a little overweight, a little chubby. Okay. We got something to work with. We got that belly to work with. Right. You know, and, and that's, and that's awesome. That's such a great, a great, a great place to be. So don't see physical limitations as actual limitations. See them as something to work with. I used to practice with a man who had a fake leg. He had had his leg amputated when he was like in his twenties. So by the time I was practicing with him, when he was like in his fifties, he had spent most of his life with it. So it was no big deal to him that he had a fake leg right like he's used to it but i remember the first time david worked with him david like walked in and was like oh he just got so excited because he'd never worked with someone before who was an amputee and just the excitement to be able to even though my friend worked really well with his amputated leg but the fact that it was a, a metal leg on one side was exciting to david to be able to see the pos we have po we have different possibilities now Right. We have different possibilities because you don't have a physical leg for me to work with. Energetically, you still do energetically. What's what's this going to be like? So, OK, we have someone with several pal palsy. We have different possibilities now, and that's exciting. There's still growth there. And so, again, you're not an Olympiad. You're not you're not going to be auditioning for the Rockets. It's not what we're doing. We're just trying to help you wake up that hatha, that upwards and that rising and lowering energy, wake up that pelvic floor, wake up that, that, that life force inside of you through, through any type of exercise does not have to be a marathon. So anyway, let's, okay. We got this one too. This is great. Alicia, who comes to our classes on zoom, which we'll talk about at the end. I have huge issues with my dad, girl, same. He, he's passed on now, but those struggles are still there. And I also have major back issues. So finding the connection is something I'd love to learn more about. Cindy, I'm going to let you take this one away. Well, your, um, your body holds it. You always say that your body is an Akashic record within itself. And it holds the memories of everything that you've experienced in this lifetime and and all the lifetimes that holds the genetic material of, of your ancestry, of your family, is all coded there within your body. Your uh, body responds to every thought that you're having. Like every thought that you're having, every cell in your body responds to that thought. So the information is in the body. And if you're trying to figure out, okay, like so I've had some daddy issues. I've had daddy issues too. And, you know, how, it, what your body basically tells you, especially if you're having like issues, it, it, it just might be saying, okay, well, 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 maybe there's still some emotional, some residual emotional stuff that's going on. Um, and if you're, you're, you know, if you're in, in, it could be that there is a connection there. It could be that 
that the back issues could be a totally different thing. So it, it kind of depends on what you're wanting to work on. You can go through the body and you can start to work with the back issues, for instance, and let what you receive inform your psychology. Um, Cause you can, you can go, so, so your mind informs your body, but your body also informs your mind. So maybe just like deciding, okay, I'm just gonna work on my back issues right now. I'm gonna like work on them. I'm gonna listen, just intuitively listen to what my body has to say. And eventually if there is uh, some kind of a connection there, it will come through just by simply doing the work and asking the question and not putting your own interpretation into it, but letting, um, letting your body inform you. And you never know what you're going to get. It could be a daddy issue. It could be something totally different. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh -huh. the, your dad passing, that could be showing it itself. I mean, I'm not saying that it could be a back issue, but it's, it's, um, it's tapping into that deeper intelligence, asking the right questions. And like, if you're going through the body, like working through what helps, what works, what feels right, listening to it. And oftentimes just by doing that, the connection will reveal itself to you. If that makes sense. Yeah. I love that. Ask, ask it what it wants. What is when your back hurts, just say like, what are you trying to, what are you trying to tell me? Like, what are you trying to communicate with me? I love that. And that's because it's your, because again, it's a redirection, right? Usually if we have an injury or if we have something that's out of alignment is, is telling you, you need to redirect something. Yeah. You need to, redirect either your thought you need to redirect you maybe you need to redirect how you're holding yourself yeah um, and if you think of your back issue as a redirection and you're just saying okay how how do i need to redirect myself here like how do i need to redirect myself here then a lot of the answers will begin to come up not just again physically physically it will but then um you'll get clarity in other things as well too I, you know, that's it's, it's literal redirection because uh, I have a bad back too, Alicia, and I have str I've punched a teacher coming out of a back bend. Like I really struggled with doing these back back bends. My whole, my whole, I'm, I'm good and better at them now, but what really shipped for me, it was that redirect. And I say this in the class all the time. I had a teacher say, it's not back bending, it's stomach opening. And when I redirected the energy to the front of my body, the back of my body lost a lot of tension and was able to actually bend. And I was actually able to strengthen mm -hmm. the front of my body, which is probably what the back of my body needed because the core isn't just your stomach, it's also your back. And so that is a literal redirect. And don't worry, girl, I think a lot of us have daddy issues. So, um, you know, I, I think I think you're at you're in a you're in good company. And I want to bring up something too that happens a lot. Sometimes when you start the path of, of spiritual healing, especially through yoga or an exercise program, a lot of times what's going to happen is like three months in, maybe it's different for different people. Sometimes six week in, weeks in, an old injury will flare up. And a lot of mm -hmm. people make the mistake of like quitting at that time or thinking they need to rest. Don't, that's the worst thing you can do. Tell your teacher if it's flaring up, take modifications, but keep moving, keep moving the energy because if you stop and you rest for a minute to let it just it's not it's it's going to get stagnant again right it's like that flowing water so like if you have a knee issue for example and all of a sudden your knee issue flares up if i have a student they need to let me know that so i'll tell them the modifications to do so that they're not they're working again with the energy not against or with the injury not against it but we're keeping the energy moving we're keeping it going. A rolling stone gathers no moss, right? We're keeping it flowing. And then eventually, hopefully it will end up. Um, they say that Guruji used to get really excited because like when you, one knee would get bad, he gets so excited. He'd be like, okay, this knee, the next knee, and then going. Like this knee is going to get bad, but it's going to get better. But then your, your other knee is going to get bad, but then it's going to it's gonna go. It's all going to go. You're going to work through it. You know, another thing is the yoga fever. It's very, very common when you start a deep spiritual practice, especially involving exercise, you know, after a few months in, maybe at night to have like a low grade fever and then it'll be gone the next day. And that's, that's what we call the yoga fever. And Guruji used to get really excited about this too, because it meant that old karma was burning, right? In order to create new patterns, old patterns need to be 
be removed. And that would be like burning a compost pile, right? Now, of course, if your fever gets really high, you need to, to address it with a doctor or wherever, however you feel like you need to address it. But like low grade fevers are common in the beginning and then they'll, they'll pass, they'll pass. Every time I start incorporating new postures into my practice, I get a still, I'll still to this day, we'll get a little low grade fever sometimes. It's just, it's just, it just means that your body, your body's reforming itself. It's creating new patterns. Now, this one I already answered because um, I just said looking at the dosha system. Um, I have an immune disorder uh, that is undiagnosed. My body goes through frequent cycles of extreme exhaustion and digestive issues. My whole body will feel weak, and I won't be able to do anything but sleep. It's not caused by depression, and it's not psychosomatic. Actually, I will say everything is actually psychosomatic. That's kind of the spiritual perspective is like literally everything is psychosomatic. I thought I had Crohn's for a while, but my doctor is thinking uh, has has mitosis. I don't know what else to do or eat anymore. I'm low income. I said for digestion issues, um, literally everything is to an extent psychosomatic because the mind creates the the thought came first, right? The body yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Everything is reacting to thought, but. Um, I've done a many, many videos on the doshas and for my digestive issues, it literally was fixed with eating for my dosha. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Cindy? Um, there is, yeah. I mean, I also am into the, the thought that, you know, especially when you're dealing with something that's chronic, mm -hmm. um, even though you you might not think it's psychosomatic, but when I have issues, like for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, I'm pretty sure that I have this, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's familial something. So I, my body produces um, cholesterol. It produces excessive cholesterol. I mean, to the point that it could cause problems for me down the line with you know heart issues and, and strokes and stuff like that. And it's a genetic thing. And yes, and, and I could go about it and say, oh, well, it's just a genetic thing. And yes, I mean, it is a ge genetic thing. And it's something that I have to be mindful about. You know, I, you know, I have to watch certain things that, that I eat. I can't, uh, I don't want to put an additional cholesterol to my body when I have, when my body's already producing too much. But what I did start asking myself is, um, what is it within my body? Why does my body feel the need to produce? Like, why does my liver feel the need to produce an excessive amount of cholesterol? Because you know, your body is not usually trying to work against you, even right. though it might feel like it. Body is actually trying to help you or support you. And uh, some of the 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 psycho the psychological analysis toward uh, high cholesterol, especially if your body produces it, it's creating a blockage. Like you think I said, this is creating a blockage in my body. What is it trying to block? And in the case of cholesterol, a lot of it is it's just, it's blocking uh, your ability to feel joy. And so I'm like. Well, why is my body wanting to produce this inability to feel a whole lot of joy? Because that is kind of my life. I'm, um, uh, I, I uh, have a, a, a mindset that I've been working on where uh, nothing is ever enough. Like there's always got to like, I get something, got it next. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? Like I have this, this compulsion of I always have to be doing more. And so I have that, you know, which definitely blocks me from feeling joy. But but where is that compulsion actually coming from? It's like, why? You know, what is it that my body is trying to protect me from, from not having joy? You know, it could be a survival mechanism. Maybe it has to do with being too complacent. And if you're too complacent, you die. You yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. So it's like when you get diagnosed with something that's chronic, one of the first things that I, you know, that I, or if I've seen a client I, is ask, is like, why is my body producing this for me? And it is more that, you know, I could totally blame mine on genetics. Mine's just genetics it came from my dad. But, you know, honestly, I feel like there's something deeper, something more to, more to that for me to be able to do something about it. Because if you get caught up in the mindset of saying, oh, this is just it, this is what I have, period. It's very disempowering for me yeah. 
But if I can start to figure out things that I can do, so yeah, maybe feeling weak, feeling tired, feeling sleepy. Um, what is it about disengaging from life, closing yourself off from life, disengaging from life, being sleepy? What is that trying to protect you from? And are you willing to allow more, you know, like get out of the mindset of this is just what I am. This is who I am. This is just what it is. This is what the uh, doctors have told me. I can't choose any differently. No matter what I do, I always feel sleeping. I mean, you can get caught up in that loop. Yeah. Believe me, I know I've been caught up in those loops before. But um, is that loop really helping you? Is there something, anything that you can do to just start to ask a different, this is kind of like with, with Alicia, can you start to ask a different questions? Approach it from a different point of view that you may have not considered before. And I will say the digestions, uh, digestion issues, that speaking of psychosomatic, because I agree, like in my perspective, literally everything is psychosomatic because the the consciousness, it's like that whole idea, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in spirituality. Keep talking. I need to plug in my computer. Yeah, you're fine. In spirituality, <laughs> consciousness came first. And so everything that's in your life is directed by your thought, by consciousness. And your body's not trying to punish you. I agree with Cindy. The body is trying to talk to you. It's trying to show you. It's your template for where there is inaccurate um understanding you know where there where there is no enlightenment right and we and, it, and we all have that every single one of us has this that's why we're in a human experience for that refinement so the digestion issues that is a fascinating psychosomatic um rabbit hole to go down we can't go down everything because we're already well over an hour now but i would um someone someone nine four three two i would i would challenge you to look up what digestion issues mean spiritually. What is a, an immune disorder? Is your body literally attacking you? Why? What ask your stomach? What your stomach? You have people who struggle with depression also typically have digestion issues as well. So there's there's because there's just as many neurotransmitters in your stomach as there are in your brain. So if you're think about when you're nervous, you get butterflies. When you're excited, you get butterflies. Your stomach holds a lot of emotional information. And it, for me, a lot of mine went away with with um, when I started eating for my dosha. But what happened, even though the food was changing and the energy of the food what was also happening, though, is that I took my power back because I had been a slave to what my parents had given me to eat, what society told me I should eat. But when I said, oh, my body's telling me with this these digestion issues that a raw apple isn't good for me because I'm a vata. When I realized that and I just stopped doing that and I started eating for what my body needed, I took my power back and my di digestion got better. Also, what helps with digestion, again, is exercise. Okay, like look at if you struggle with constipation, we listen, no one ever wants to hang out with yoga people because all we talk about is poops and periods. But um, if you watch marathon runners, a lot of times they shit their pants because they've jiggled their colon. And I'm not I'm not telling you to do that. Like, I don't want you to do that. But if you start to like move your body in that up and down, you, you start to simulate that movement of the, the getting the organs to move up and down, you're going to start to get the, the, the digestion fluids going again. It's like when we do inversions like downward dog or a headstand, you know, we're, we're resting the organs because we're flipping them upside down and sometimes giving them that different, you know, flipping them upside down, even in just a downward dog is going to give that simulation as well. So I, I, I look at that in this, just my perspective as someone who's worked in this business industry for 18 years. And I say, someone, someone look at your dosha. And also it's totally psychosomatic. So I wouldn't count that out. I, I think you, and I think that's and the greatest gift because now you can take your power back. And again, it's the same thing. Just start with what you can do. At least that's what I feel. I mean, you know, if you're struggling with income and and stuff, you know, there and, and it's really easy. And I've been there before several times to just get caught up in the loop of feeling trapped. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, I, I I feel trapped. I feel like 
everything is kind of going against me and it's just it's a it's a very yucky uncomfortable feeling and i know that feeling and it sucks <laughs> but i also believe that there is always one solution that's available to you right now so even if you you know you have one dollar in the bank account your body is in this condition it's a mess and then your life might be falling apart you know there is always one solution even if it's just a, a baby step that is available to you right now at this very moment there is one thing there is one thing that you can do right now at this very moment that will help to take you to the next step into the next step into the next step and so it's like doing that one little thing, whether it is, um, you know, going for a, a little walk or, and it, and it might be totally unrelated. It could be, you know, you have to clean out your closet or, yeah. you know, make your, make your bed every day or uh, there's something. Uh, I guarantee you, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, there is one thing that is available to you that you can do right now that will lead you in the direction that you want to go and so just listen and do that one thing whatever that one thing is i would say too when you're feeling exhausted and you want to nap i because that's a problem i would say put your favorite music on and dance just by yourself and see what happens see how that changes your perspective on life because yeah, absolutely. 100% Cindy. Well, we, this has been a really awesome episode. I want to take a moment, you guys make sure I'm going to put all Cindy's links in the description box below. Make sure you're subscribed to her YouTube channel. Now, Cindy, we at Sacred Garden, we have zoom options. So we mm -hmm. have, Alicia. she's been zooming in. So what, what days do you teach Cindy? Um, what times do you teach? This is all Eastern time guys. So if you are coming from a different time zone, make sure you realize that we're in Eastern time. So just act, you know, schedule yourself accordingly for your, for your, um, your time zone. But what, what days and times do you teach Cindy at Sacred Garden at your, at your, at your, not, not every single one of my classes are available through Zoom, but the ones that are, I have a Monday, 5 30 PM Eastern standard and I have a Wednesday, 10 AM. And I can't remember if my Saturday was late. No. I think the, those are the, the the two classes that I have that are available through Zoom Monday at five thirty and Wednesdays at, at ten a.m. Um, and mine, are, right? I don't know. I have to look on my schedule, look, but, I'll but look yeah, on the you can you know you can also look on the schedule and and see which ones are, a Zoom. are available. I just, Where I just you live in the area. Just come. One of my classes are available through Zoom. But not all of my classes are uh, available through the new subpoena. And then part of the reason is because some of the classes, they get really uh, crowded. Mm -hmm. And the studio space is really small. And then the, the, the whole camera just gets completely yeah. locked out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, um, I will say, I'll tell for Alicia, who asked the question yesterday after we were finishing uh, the class up. I, you know, I watched the Zoom during the class, but at closing... I knew she was there, but she keeps herself. And then all of a sudden she unmuted herself and said something. I jumped. I was like, I thought it was a ghost. I laughed so hard because then all of a sudden she unmuted herself to say goodbye. And so I laughed so hard because all of a sudden the voice came out of the Zoom. But yes, my uh, 6.30 a.m. Eastern time uh, fusion class is available on Zoom and the Ashtanga class on on uh, Sunday, not Wednesday, Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. But there's so many great teachers at Sacred Garden who have classes on Zoom, you guys. And so um, if this is something you're interested in, I'm going to put Sacred Garden's website in the description box below so you can read all the class des des uh, descriptions. And if you want to try a class, you can sign up for Zoom. I know for my 6.30 a.m. Wednesday class, if you sign up for that class, do it before Tuesday afternoon because since... Yes. Cindy's the night owl, so she's not going to be available in the morning to send the Zoom link if you sign up. So make Do it sure the night before. Night before. Sign up for the class the, the, the <laughs> night before, and I'll get you I'll get the, you the Zoom link. But yes, if you don't. Up at 4.30 in the morning, yeah. I'm sleeping. Damn, <laughs> yeah, asleep. she's not going to be able to send you the link, so just make <laughs> sure that. If that ever does happen, <laughs> we'll just put it towards the next class, but like, just make sure that you're, yeah. you're, you get that in before, um, before the night, the evening comes. So, um, and yeah, all, there's so many great teachers at the, at the, at Secret Garden that you can zoom into. If you live in the area, please, we've gotten a lot of students through YouTube that have, now, now are, 
are coming mm -hmm. a lot. And so that's awesome. So all are welcome. Everyone is welcome. Um, there's so many different uh, body shapes and sizes that are in Sacred Garden. You are totally welcome to come. Um, we'd love to have you. You have a beginner course starting soon, or has it already started? The beginner series. Yeah, it's already started, but you can probably join in if you, because there's only one, uh, it only went one session and it goes all through the Sundays in April. So if that's something you're interested, yeah. I'll also put Cindy's email if you've got any more questions about that. Now you have, do you have any more courses coming up, Cindy, you want to advertise? Mm, um, I'm in the middle of the alchemist right now. The shaman will start again in September. So if it's something that you want to think about, all that information is on the website too. So if you want like deeper work about, you know, it is very much deep spiritual work. And and a lot of it is some of the things that we've talked about already is like making that, that body mind connection and then through cultivating relationships um, outside of you that really uh, support you through all the woo woo stuff. If you like the woo woo stuff, this class is for you. <laughs> so what? Well, but, wow. but, but I always believe that the woo woo stuff needs to inform your life and it needs to improve and better your life. If, yeah. if it's woo woo for the sake of woo woo, it doesn't mean it. It's not meaningful to me. So no. I, you know, we try to bring it in that aspect that how it can actually make your life better. Yeah. Don't be a spiritual materialist. Don't just be woo woo for the sake of having an image of being woo woo. That drives me crazy. That drives me crazy. When you see these guys with, and I love a good man bun every now and again, but when you see the guys with the man bun and like 20 gazillion mala beads on their leg, dude, I'm like, shut up. You haven't meditated today. Shut up. Like, like you're wearing a costume. Shut up. You know? So I, yeah, it, it has to be, it's supposed to enrich your life, not be your life. Right. Yes. So, you know, so, um, so anyway, all right. Well, thank you, Cindy. That was a long one today. Thank you. And if you guys have any questions and you want us to cover any other aspects, let us know in the description or in the, in the comment section below. And of course, um, check out Sacred Garden. Come see me, come see Cindy, come see all of the other fabulous teachers at Sacred Garden Yoga. And, um, yeah, or if you're, if you're on Zoom, zoom in. If you're in, in the area, join us. Listen, we rock out on Wednesday mornings. I'm telling you, like, I don't know what the neighbors think of us, but we've got that rap music playing. We got the, 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 the light candles lit, lit and we're all having a grand old time on Wednesday morning. So please come join us if you get all the cool kids are here on Wednesday morning. So <laughs> anyway, totally. yeah. So all the cool kids are, are talking about Mola Bunda and <laughs> <laughs> squeezing blocks so so all right well i thank you guys so much i hope that helped clear up any of your questions let us know if you have even more questions and we will talk to you all very soon bye everybody